Growing up in a family of six and the only girl, life for Eva Kentaro Mugera was not that difficult because her mother and father were always present in her life. However, being a young girl among three boys meant that she had to work extra hard to prove herself. This explains why she has been able to defy the odds. Eva Kentaro, who goes by the slogan, always check your motive. If it looks or smells of ill will, then dump it. There's no lasting pleasure in being nasty. Is a professional lawyer who owns her own law firm. She believes in consistent evaluation of oneself, hard work, and humility above all as the pillars of success. In this week's episode of Her Moment, we bring you the lovely Eva. everybody and welcome to her moment now today we bring you another inspiring story from yet another person another woman another mother that has managed to conquer all the challenges of this world I am Sandra Kahumza but let's do this and let's learn welcome madam Eva thank you Sandra we are super excited to have you on the show same here yes same you're looking here. very beautiful I love your jacket thank you Sandra <laughs> thank you so first things first is there that one specific name they used to call you as a child? Yes. Like those nicknames they used to call us when we were little kids? Yes. It was a, it's a short form for my name. Yes. Some people still call me that. Mm. Uh, people used to, they used to call me Kenta. Kenta? Yes, okay. short for Kentaro. Mm. And those who really know me like from way back, you'll find them calling me that. So like at home or at school? At home, at school. You don't have these other names from the, the funny ones? No, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> like those other funny ones, they would call you and you just feel like, mm, No. I do not want that name at no, all. No, I haven't got those. So how was your childhood? My childhood was, um, I think, pretty much like everybody's childhood. Mm. Uh, I come from a family of four. We have four children. I have three brothers mm. and You're myself, yes. Uh, my brothers are older than me. Mm. And... Um, we lived with our parents and actually my parents are still alive okay and we my mother was my mother was a teacher she was a headmistress so she was very strict where um she, her last posting was mango senior school mm. so you stayed within the city? no we didn't stay within the school we no, stayed like within the, the city, city yes mm. but we never stayed at the school yeah yeah we stayed within the city um and yeah my dad my dad was um was a public servant mm. so pretty much you know our parents took us to school our dad always dropped us to school mm. and he picked us up from school every day and pretty much like any urban family yes. pretty much like any urban family are but you the first or the second no the i'm last? the last oh <laughs> yes my brothers are older than me okay so where yes. are they now my brothers work they're married they have families and they live here in Kampala. How was it growing up with just brothers and no sister, no, no bigger mm. sister or little sister? Did you at any point in your life feel like, oh, I wish I had a baby sister? Of course, somebody to, you know, so bully around and push around. <laughs> yes. But I would say comfortably that... Um, you were babied. Not really. That's what girl. everybody thinks. <laughs> That's what everybody thinks. But I think that um, really all eyes on you. Mm. And also, because my mother was very strict and is still very strict, mm. there was no room for you to you know, fool around or mess around. Mm. So I pretty much grew up in a home that was, was filled with love. We didn't have you know, conflict. Yeah. We never saw any conflict. We never mm. experienced conflict between our parents. Mm -hmm. So pretty much we, just like any family here really, mm. any urban family. Yeah. yeah. Did your brothers ever bully you or try of to make you feel they did. like you're not? <laughs> of course they did. Because they're just boys. Yes, of course they did. You know, when, when you'd upset them or they'd want to make you feel bad, they would say, you know what, you're not our sister. We were driving by this lonely place. Uh, then there was a baby crying in a crib. 
then mommy felt sorry then mommy just said let's put her in the car mm. and you know every time they'll tell me that of course you'll go reporting and yeah after some time they had to drop it because mm. it would really really upset my mother but honestly they were they they were good brothers and they're still good brothers so any challenges while growing up i think while growing up like any young girl mm. was the you know the conflict in the mind as to whether you can you can ably compete for certain things you can you can be considering who you, you are with boys yes, you can be who you want to be mm. but i think also growing up with boys in in some way or another helped me because i had to keep up with them Mm. So I had to do all the things that possibly they would do. Yeah. And because they were also older than me, I had to catch up and, you know, try to fit in with them. Mm. So I, I did pretty much what any person would do. I, I could climb trees. <laughs> ride a bicycle. Could ride a bicycle. I started driving early. I mm. learned how to drive very early. Mm. And I think the biggest challenge was that sometimes because you are the youngest, and because you are in this position which people think is privileged mm. people expect you to be very spoiled and people sort of you know draw up all sorts of um, conclusions. conclusions and suppositions mm. around you but you know as you grow up and you begin to prove to your to other people that you know just like any other child mm. then then that fades away but yeah. also school also helped mm. did you go to um, a single school yes single I did school, yes I did or? I went to Kitande Primary School for my primary school. Mm. Back then it wasn't yet PE, it was a good school, very mm. good school. And then I went to Gaza High School for six years. Mm. And uh, in Gaza we were basically taught that you can be whoever you want to be. Mm. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be like anybody you want to be like, mm. for as long as you set your mind to it. Mm. And then you work towards that goal. For me in life and also at home, you know, my dad would always teach us that there is nothing that's impossible. Yeah. Mm. Start with the end. This is where, what, where I want to go. This is what I want to get. And then you figure out the how to. Yes. But there was nothing like it's impossible. I remember when we were growing up, you know, you'd ask my dad the meaning of words, like if you were doing your homework, and he would not tell us. He would say no. He would Find say out for yourself. He would say you're being mentally lazy. We have three dictionaries in this house. Check. Mm. And that taught us to, you know, go the extra mile. There's nothing like saying, you know, I've failed, I can't do this. You know, you always had to have the answers to stuff. Mm. For my mother, it was, you know, the disciplinarian, teaching us, you know, making sure we do housework. Mm. I remember when we were growing up, she used to, you know, like she would hide stuff. She would hide like little pieces <laughs> of papers, like uh, behind the chairs mm. or behind the toilet door on the day you were cleaning. Mm. And then she would come back and check. And we, we had house helps. Mm. But when we're in the holiday, you know you'd you know you'd really, really work. You know. Yeah. So she would hide them just to make you see that you, you shouldn't just look at you know the places that are obvious. Mm. Always look for the secret places, always look for the secret behind things. Mm. So we grew up always, you know, having your guard up that mm. you know what, I could be checked out any any at any minute. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's and then primary school, yes, you were in a single sex school again. No, primary school, kit under primary school is a mixed school. Oh, it was. We mixed. had boys and girls. Mm. Yes. Did you ever face challenges as a girl there, considering at home you are probably pampered a bit, and then now you're in school and things have probably changed. First of all, at home I was not pampered. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I just I just had a distinctive position mm. that I'm just this girl, and I had my father. I have my father's name, mm. my father's mother's name, my grandmother's name. Mm. So that, that was the only thing. But at school, of course we were bullied as girls. Mm. Now for me it was even very complicated because they knew I had a brother in like P6 when we were in P1. And so they feared a bit. Mm. But still they used to bully me. They used to bully me about, you know, I was very short. Mm. So the short girls would always have to line up at the front. Mm. And I didn't want to line up at the front. No. So I'd always be at the back and then you know, they would push you to the front. Yeah. But you know, as because of survival instincts, as you grow up, you learn how to survive. You definitely have to. Yes, and then at some point, then they realize that they can't bully you anymore. Yeah. And they leave you alone. So did you have dreams as a child? I know every yes. child in has dreams. Did you have those specific things that, that you wanted to be? I had... Like, I want to be a doctor, I want to be I a pilot. I had very, very... <laughs> the dreams I had, I wanted to be a pilot, first of all. <laughs> because in my mind, as a pilot, mm. one, I would have a lot of money. And you would travel everywhere. But I would have the opportunity to travel the whole world, you know? Yeah. Just breeze in and breeze out. Yeah. 
and then also possibly since I travel the whole world I'll have all these nice things mm. but then you know as you go on then you realize okay to be a pilot you need to have understand physics very well were you good at science subjects I was good at chemistry mm. as a, on its own as a subject but the rest I was really an but average biology. student you know biology biology they told us that in LF we would have to split rats like cut rats <laughs> open so that one I just shut down mm. Then with physics, you know, there were all these things, pendulum, bob, all sorts of <laughs> things swinging. So I didn't really, I just made sure I did it just to pass, but mm -hmm. I wasn't really keenly interested. Yeah. Yeah, but chemistry I was interested because we had the opportunity to mix all these things, balance all these equations. It seemed interesting. Yeah, quite easy. Yeah, yeah so. So that was like A-level. That was O-level. O-level. So yes. A-level. Your, your A-level, my changing. dreams are changing. I decided mm -hmm. I wanted to be a lawyer. I decided I wanted to be a lawyer, but also I, I decided that at some point I wanted to be a writer. A writer. Yes. Okay. Uh, because I was very good at literature. Mm -hmm. But then of course, um, you know, my dad sat me down and told me, you know, anybody can be a writer. Mm -hmm. Anybody can be a writer. So you can't apply to university to do journalism just because you want to be a writer. Mm -hmm. So you can actually be a lawyer and also a writer at the same time. Mm -hmm. So then I settled for law and I applied for law. So I mean, but, but somehow I sneaked in the second choice as journalism. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I got admitted to do mm -hmm. law as a government student. Mm -hmm. and then, so you were in, let me take you back a mm -hmm. bit. You were in Gaza for all the six, six years. Six years, yes. Okay. So you applied to which uh, university? Makere University. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you got law? Yes. At that point there were no pre-entries? No, there were no well. pre-entries. We survived. <laughs> I know, we survived. We were not pre entry. So you just once you passed. Mm. I mean, we passed as government students. We got into Macquarie. We got into halls of residences yes. and and started studying. And started studying. How was it uh, in your first year? That like, you know, moving from a single sex school. Mm. I know, yes, in primary you were mm. in school, but now mm. you were in a single sex school for six years, for six good years. How was it now transforming to now the world? You're entirely on your own. Okay, it was a bit, it was a bit, um, a bit strange. Mm. Okay, in Gaza we saw boys. We used to see boys like um, for wow. socials and what and what. But yes. for a few hours, it was never enough. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know, the first few hours were wasted in, you know, trying to make sure you looked good. Yeah. <sighs> then by the time you realize that boys are about to go, it's, <laughs> there's, a, there's very little time remaining. But anyway, um, we got to university and. I remember when I was going to university, my mother wrote me a letter. She didn't talk to, she didn't say anything, she didn't even sit me down like for a lecture because I was waiting for it, I was anticipating. Mm. And I kept on practicing what kind of serious face I would make, you know, when she's giving me this lecture. But she didn't. Mm. She wrote to me a letter. And that week when I was going to university, when I was about to start university, she gave me the letter in an envelope where she had given me the pocket money. So I sat down and I read the letter. The letter was basically telling me that, you know, we're not there anymore mm -hmm. to see what you're doing, to restrain you. It's really up to you. Mm -hmm. But whatever you do, always ask yourself, if my parents heard that I was doing this, or if my parents saw that I was doing this, would they be happy? Would they be happy? What would they think? Mm -hmm. And I think that that always restrained us, mm -hmm. restrained me really as a student. Mm -hmm. So we got to Makere, I mean, it was one day gear first of all. Mm. One day gear seemed like it didn't sleep. It was a bustle of activity. <laughs> I know. You know, with all this somersaulting chicken mm. and these takeaways. But I think we remained, I remained focused on the fact that I really had to finish school and I kept on remembering. Actually, I used to get out that letter and read it every so often. So I kept on remembering that I had to strike a balance between reading and studying hard and also having fun and exploring the world. So I had to strike that balance. Yes. So were your parents really very instrumental in deciding whether you should do law or it was entirely your own decision? Like you made, uh, did you ever sit down with your parents and say, you know, mommy, daddy, I need you to like this Yes, direction? yes. Or, you know, they would, they would bring up, they, they would invite our parents to school mm -hmm. when we were making those decisions. And for me, they asked me, my parents asked me, so what do you want to do? Now at that time, me, I wanted to do law, but then my friends were, were applying for journalism. So my friends were like, but you, I thought we had agreed we are going to do journalism. So at that point, <clears throat> my father counseled me and he said, you know, 
anybody can be a writer because I told you I wanted to be a writer. Mm. So he told me anybody can be a writer, but <coughs> not anybody can be a lawyer. Mm. So you can be a lawyer and you can be a writer. Mm. So that's when I decided to do the law thing. Mm. Yes. And unfortunately, I've never, I haven't really pursued much my writing skills mm. because of time. Time hasn't been there. But it's something that I hope I can do maybe in my later years, mm. probably when I settle down. But I enjoy to write, uh, to read rather, I enjoy to read and just to keep up with what's happening. Mm. So in a way, I think yes, my parents influenced me. Influenced yes. yes. So anyway, still at the university, mm. what challenges did you face? I mean, I know there's so much pressure that happens when you're at yes. the university, you're yes. seeing your friends yeah. having different things, yes. they are traveling probably, they're mm. driving, they're mm. doing all these different things. Mm. Do you ever have certain sort of like uh, pressures like mm. coming onto you and you just feel like, oh. But you know Sandra, the way you're asking, I was at university several years ago. Yes. We didn't have as, okay, we had, the, people had stuff, but it's not like what it is like today. Mm. So for me, we had the basics, I had the basics, I had the TV. Mm. Okay, like probably entering someone's room and it has like literally everything you want to have in your own room. Like what? A TV, a fridge? Mm -hmm. Those ones I had. Poofers, you know, big poofers. And but the that. only thing that we used to really look at is people, people who used to go like abroad for holidays. You see? What? <laughs> and yeah. Okay. The I biggest challenge I can tell you what that, that was at university mm. was striking a balance between, between studying. And exploring the world, mm -hmm. disco, all that, and some of our friends that we had studied with actually failed to find that balance mm -hmm. because the world is out there. I mean, all the places that you've been hearing go, oh, those days there were still club silk. I don't know if it's still there. There was Ange, okay, there was Ange, all those places where we could go. Yeah. So you really wanted to go and see eh, what's at that place, mm -hmm. but remember the hall would close at midnight, mm -hmm. and then remember we were day students, you'd have class the next day. So you had to be very, very careful about mm. how you balance the two. So for me, I think that that was the biggest challenge at university. And then we also had strikes. Mm. The strikes would really paralyze everything because sometimes you'd be at the other side of the university. I was, uh, was a resident in Africa Hall. Mm. So while you'd be on the other side at law school, a strike would erupt and you can't cross over back to your hall of residence. Mm. So you'd have to start, you know, benching around in CCE and all that. But luckily we had friends there, so we were comfortable. So for me, I think the biggest challenge at university was, was really striking that balance. Mm -hmm. For me, that was the biggest challenge. Is there that one special moment at the university that you enjoyed, that you felt like, mm, this is something I could actually go back and do at the university? Yes. Mm, what was it? I remember one time we had a trip. Our progy was not like yours, you guys. <laughs> so like, one time we had a trip, mm. and the trip was to a park, a national park, Where? Moya. Oh. And people used to you, people used to organize those trips. So I had paid because I thought if I asked my parents, mm. my mother would start telling me stories. What? So I said, you know what? I'm going to go for this trip mm. without telling anybody. Mm. So we had paid and everything had been sorted, everything, all, all preparations were in high gear. Mm. And even packed was supposed to be going that weekend. So that Friday, my mother calls me and tells me that her driver was going to come and pick me up because I think we had some visitors who were coming home and she needed me to help her. Mm. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> okay. I can relate, actually. Yes, I yes. died like 10 times because I couldn't tell her about the trip that had been organized and here was my friends had already you know mm. sorted everything out we had planned we had saved for it i had paid mm. and i knew how campus trips were it was non-refundable mm. but also i was looking very funny you know for my friends mm. my friends were thinking but also you we didn't you know this probably mm. but they also knew that i wouldn't tell her mm. i fear that you know if i would tell her she would think you know what, what about school when are you going to come back the truth is that trip mm. was going to be like one week mm. away from school but I had it all worked out that I would catch up. Yes. So I missed the trip. Mm. And for me, it was so devastating. I had to wait for my friends to come back and give me the whole... There was no Story. social media, like how it is yeah. like now, like you do WhatsApp pictures. So it was really devastating, mm. Considered that, considering that I had paid. I didn't get a refund. Mm. And you also missed the trip. I also missed the trip. Mm. And then I had to attend class, of course. Yeah. And which was the better... Which was the better part, and my friends would catch up from me. But yes. 
So is there anything uh, at the university that you thought you did mm. that you regret and you feel like if you, God gave you a chance from heaven and said, you know what, mm. ever change this? Is there that one specific yes. moment that you I think if I had concentrated, you know, first oh. year I was really exploring and struggling to balance. Mm. I think that uh, probably would have got even better grades mm. than we have. Not, of course we got good grades, but probably better grades. But I also think that um, I could have spent my holidays better. Yeah. Probably working with um, a law firm. A law firm. Mm. Things that relate to what I'm doing now. Mm. Things that relate to my career. But probably God hadn't decided that that was the time mm. for me to do that. Mm. Yeah. So those are some of the regrets. Probably mm. now I'll be, you know, in a teaching job somewhere. Mm. So law school was four years? Yes. Then? Four yes. years. So how did you get out of all? Did you go to LDC? Yes. So tell us about the experience with LDC. So I went to how LDC. How you started actually your real journey as an yeah, I, I went to LDC. I was one week late mm -hmm. for LDC because I had gone on a holiday mm -hmm. and I had got the dates wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, my mother met a friend, a parent to a friend of mine mm -hmm. and, and the parent I discovered while I was still on holiday mm. that school was about to start, but I needed to finish this holiday. Mm. So I didn't, I didn't say I kept quiet. So my mom met her friend who had a child who was studying with us. Mm. And her friend told her, oh, the Vincent went back to school. Uh, how is Eva doing? What? So my mother called. Uh, she called in a relative that I was staying with in London. And she said, tell her she needs to come back as soon as possible because school has started. Mm. And I was like, but it's only one week, I will come back when it what? When it starts. Mm. So I came back for LDC. LDC was a shock for most of us mm. because it was you being able to regurgitate what you had learned in the four years mm. at university here. So you had to find ways of catching up. Mm. So we had to make friends with the ladies that photocopy and we had to identify for them the, who the smart kids were at the time, who we thought were the very smart kids. Mm. So we'll tell them that, you know, if you see Zulaika photocopying anything, mm. photocopy for me, I'll come and settle you. Mm. Just to make sure I would catch up. Because sometimes the smart kids didn't want to, you know, give us to their share, work. Yeah. Probably because they thought that while they were studying very hard, maybe we were just relaxing, mm. you know, in the apartments where we were staying or in the places where we were staying. So LDC was hard work. It was hard work and I can tell you that even looking back today, I think that we passed by the grace of God mm. because yes, we worked hard, but there are so many people who even worked harder than us mm. that didn't make it through. You know the failure rate at LDC. Mm. It's never been any better. Mm. It's always been bad. So when I left LDC, I got a job. The month I left LDC, I got a temporary job with New Vision. Mm. With New Vision, I was just supposed to go through the papers before they go to print to see if there's anything defamatory that will mm get new vision suit mm. and it was a crazy job first of all um, I was expected to come to work like at about maybe 11 10 but I would not leave until about 7 p.m. Mm. and you know that um, taxi place like at uh, the police ginger road yes. It used to be very lonely. Mm. So my parents would worry about me, you know, I'd get home late and all that. But the flip side was that them, I'd never earned money like that mm. in my entire life by then. So How much were you earning at that point? I was earning like 780,000. What? Your very first job? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and you're just going through the papers, just seeing what could be. Yes, but you not. know, with my boss, I would get into trouble mm. if something slipped but 700,000 at that point was a lot of yes money. that was in 20 24 2006 okay not 2006 2004 okay yeah. the first salary I chewed the salary I chewed the salary it jumped <laughs> to get finished <laughs> I bought some presents for like my mother, my mm. father, but still I had money. Mm. So that was a flip Did side. Did you have of like job. a saving like culture in you, like feeling like you know nothing, I've money nothing, I save and all nothing. Like, mm. The money was for enjoyment only. Mm. There was nothing like that. Okay. So two months oh. later, after being in that job, that okay. was like the third month that job, I got a job offer with Standard Chartered mm. Bank. So I had to say goodbye to that job and leave. I left very well amicably. Right. Yeah. 
did my resignation and left. I went to Standard Chartered where I was going to earn, I think, 1,050,000. Eh, eh. Okay, you know what? Let's come back to that, to that part a bit later on. For now, let's now go in for a short break. But when we return, we'll continue with Eva's story. And I know it, it is really, really the story that we really are looking for. Stay tuned to Rico TV. Mm -hmm.